are any narrators reliable? What is reliable? So unreliability springs from this destabilization of feeling that we have a common platform. Earlier authors and readers, they belong to same communities, British people writing for British readers. Now everybody is writing for everybody. But again, as I was saying, in this world of personalization, do common platforms exist anymore? Hello and welcome back to Nibble Pop. You have been requesting me a lot to do videos on literary terms, different aspects of literature. Today in this video, we're going to look at a very, very important topic, narrator and point of view in fiction. So what we're going to cover today in this video are, you know, meaning of narrator, how many types of narrators are there, what is the meaning of perspective and different kinds of points of view. Along with this, we are also going to have a little bit of discussion on the concept of reliable and unreliable narrator. So don't skip anything in this video because this is not going to help just in your undergraduate exams but also in any kind of competitive exams uh, such as NET, uh, the school service exams and this is also very important if you are planning to write fiction, novels, short stories of your own. So having an idea about what kind of narrators are there and choosing which kind suits you will make a major difference in the way you would express yourself in fiction. So I'll expect you to stay with me till the end. This is Monami Mukherjee. Welcome once again. Narration is an act of telling something. Usually, it's telling a story. The persona who does this is the narrator. Now, when you pick up a book, it can be a novel, it can be a collection of short stories, you will notice that it is as if somebody is telling you the story. We casually feel as if it's the author who is speaking to us or it's the author who tells the story. But the author carefully creates a different personality who is actually telling the story. This personality is the narrator. How is the narrator different from the author? An author can be a female and in a book written by a female author, you can have a male narrator. Similarly, a male author can have a female narrator. A very aged author can have a very young narrator and a very young author can have an aged narrator. So it doesn't matter who the author is, there can be a different kind of narrator telling you the story that is going on. Now depending on the way in which the narrator tells the story, we have different kinds of narrators. And uh, you can say the narrator is the character or the persona uh, through whose perspective the whole story unfolds in front of us. What is perspective? Perspective is the way you look at things. So we see the story through the eyes of the narrator. Now what does a narrator do then essentially? You would say, ma'am, he just tells the story. He just gives information. No, he doesn't just only give information. I'm using the pronoun he, it can also be a she. So it's just for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'm using the one uh, masculine gender here. Uh, that doesn't mean that narrators are always uh, male figures, they can be female. So when the narrator decides to tell you a story, he doesn't only give information, he also keeps information away from you, the readers. So uh, you can say that narrators give information and also chooses which information not to give. And this choice is what makes the story. It creates a desired effect. What kind of desired effect? Suppose in a story that the readers are reading, the narrator has given some information to the readers. The information which the narrator has given to the readers are not known to the characters in the story. When things happen in the story, the readers have a greater knowledge about 
what is going to happen to them or what has already happened before which the characters do not know and that creates the effect of dramatic irony situational irony all right situations in which the narrator does not give us information which the characters know so there can be things that the characters know but we are not given that information in that case it creates a sense of mystery and suspense as in detective stories crime fiction so does the narrator know everything i mean does he know everything and then he chooses what to tell us and what not sometimes yes sometimes no depending on whether the narrator knows everything or not we have two kinds of narrators or two kinds of point of view all right through which a story is told one is omniscient and one is non omniscient or limited so this is the first categorization we will be looking at omniscient narrator and non omniscient narrator all right now omniscient means all knowing okay so it comes from omnia which means all and scientia which means knowledge it's latin so omniscient means the narrator knows everything now in real life uh, do you see anybody who knows everything no we can assume that there is this god like figure of the narrator who knows everything so obviously that narrator cannot be a character in the story because if you are a character in the story you only know something but if you know everything and everything means not just what is happening during the timeline of the story this omniscient narrator knows about past present future almost with a tyrian view i mean complete knowledge about what is going on inside the minds of the characters what is going on in their lives how they are behaving with each other how they are behaving in private so this whole thing that is inside the mind of the narrator is displayed in front of us so that is an omniscient narrator and this is always in the third person so this we will come to a bit later different kinds of uh, narration so first is omniscient narrator who knows everything and if you are talking about examples well take up stories uh, or novels written by hardy written of the native for instance um, there we have this kind of a narrator who is commenting on egden heath Uh, how the characters live there uh, what are the philosophies of these people living there what is clem your bright's philosophy how these philosophies clash with each other and how the story develops uh, through this personality of eustacia why so there is this person commenting on this whole thing informing us about things which we do not know about and not just about the story line but also about the past Uh, even such as uh, the great bonfire that is recreated in Eustacia's backyard so all this thing is shown to us by a persona who knows everything and that is the omniscient narrator speaking to us in the third person all right that is the narrator doesn't use i to denote himself because he is not present in the story now does it give a more objective view we will come to that later now why is omniscient narrative used omniscient narrator uh, gives us multiple points of view of characters too so it doesn't fixate on one single character but it gives the readers the choice to make judgment about uh, you know who the uh, he, he, the reader likes or which character emerges as the hero so there is a kind of objectivity uh, which is uh, achievable if you are going for omniscient narration and of course if you are uh, talking about different characters then you are also creating contrast and uh, through those contrasting uh, figures we have a storyline developing omniscient narration also uh, helps in creating a backdrop uh, in, in describing to us the background of the story so that we feel more connected to the story we as readers Uh, and of course um, if you are an author aspiring uh, to write fiction uh, and if you want to use uh, um, a narration in which you can control uh, 
the characters and at the same time you can create a, a suspense in the in the readers uh, challenge them to interpret things then you take up omniscient narration now two types of omniscient narrators are there which is a you can say subdivision of omniscient narrator one is a real god like omniscient narrator who knows about what's going on inside the minds of the characters that we see in hardy for instance so that kind of a, an omniscient narrator is called an involved omniscient narrator who is very involved in the story who, who knows about what's going on inside the minds another omniscient narrator is fly on the wall so the narrator is like this fly or like a cctv camera on the wall uh, and from there uh, he notices what's going on what what people are doing so what they're saying so that kind of a narrator doesn't give uh, much insight into what's happening in the minds of the characters and the readers will have to somehow interpret the actions of the characters and then conclude from those uh, deductions what they think about the characters so fly on the wall means a little less powerful narrator whereas uh, omniscient involved narrator means somebody who has full uh, idea about what's going going on in the minds of the characters too and then in in case of the fly on the wall narrator the readers are more free to draw their conclusions uh, about the characters now this was omniscient narration let's come to non omniscient narration the narrator doesn't have the full knowledge the knowledge is limited so it's also called limited narrator or it's non omniscient narration now limited narration can be through different ways the most popular one you can say or most obvious one is the first person limited perspective or first person limited narration this means that the narrator is a character in the novel and he or she is speaking to the readers directly using the pronoun i david copperfield jane eyer i mean in, in all uh, autobiographical novels where uh, you can feel as if the author is talking about uh, their own lives you can see this kind of narration uh, and the fact that these are not autobiographies autobiographies means where an author simply writes about the story of his or her life there there is no difference between narrator and author the narrator is the author but in case of autobiographical novels there might be similarities extreme similarities between the narrator who is speaking in david copperfield and charles dickens the narrator of jane eyre might be very very similar to the author but there are differences that's why i'm telling you that the narrator is not the author even when it is a first person narrative so long as this is not a a real autobiography another very popular example is ishmael from melville's moby dick the stories are told using the pronoun i like i am seeing this i Uh, did this this happened to me so it is the story told to us by the narrator and it's usually the story that happens in the life of the narrator and most of the cases the narrator is in the center of the story so what is special about first person point of view or first person narration it is limited of course if you are a person in or a character in a story Uh, of course you don't know everything you don't know what's happening uh, when people uh, talk about you in your absence so you will give us if you are the narrator of a first person narration you will give us an account of what is happening when you are present somewhere all right so it's of course limited but it's not always a negative thing it creates a personal attachment with the readers you begin to look at other characters through the eyes of the character who is telling you the story and you feel more involved and you automatically uh, identify uh, with this this narrator or with this figure who is telling you the story because many times we can look inside the heart of this narrator 
even when we cannot see what is happening inside the hearts of others. So first person limited is a beautiful way of establishing a bond of trust between readers and the narrator of course. But does this create a problem, this trust? Yes, indeed. If this narrator telling uh, the story in the first person is not reliable, we then get shocked at the end of the story uh, when we realize that we shouldn't have trusted this narrator at all. This is the case of an unreliable narrator. Now that I have mentioned this, let's talk about unreliable narrator a bit. It was a term coined by Wayne C. Booth. He uh, was a critic and in rhetoric of fiction in 1961, he coined this expression unreliable narrator. So keep that in mind that comes a lot of times in uh, net exams. Now what does Wayne C. Booth tell there? He says that, um, you see, authors and readers, they share a common idea about what is good, what is morally acceptable and uh, what is a version of reality, sane version of reality. If the narrator deviates from that, then that narrator is unreliable. What do I mean by deviate from that? Society has an established set of rules, you can say, moral codes, ethics. If the narrator fails to comply to these, when does a narrator fail to comply to these? Sometimes intentionally, sometimes by mistake. Suppose the narrator, using first person narrative, telling you a story about his life, is basically a serial killer. Or he is a liar, he is a fraud or she is a mad woman in the attic, then in the narration there will be gaps and problems which the readers will be able to detect and by the end of the novel or the short story or whatever that narrator is narrating, this realization will dawn on the readers that throughout the story this narrator had been unreliable, you cannot rely on what the narrator has been telling you. This is the case in the murder of Roger Ackroyd. Many of you have uh, read that uh, book. It's there in the syllabus of many universities. Uh, in Roger Ackroyd, Dr. Shepherd, he's telling us this story. He is the narrator, but we do not realize that he is the murderer till the end of the story. And then that realization shocks us because then we begin to question his observations too. Like if he was the killer, of course, he would present to us characters in negative light who are not that negative maybe. But he wants us to see that way because he is the criminal. So in short, whenever a narrator is basically untrustworthy, then we have the uh, condition of unreliable narration. If you have read the story, The Yellow Wallpaper, do you think the narrator in that story is an unreliable narrator? Because we realize at the end of the story that this woman is a mad woman and considered to be hysterical by her family. Give me your ideas about this and if you haven't uh, read the story or if you do not have any idea about this story then uh, you can just you know go and watch the video which I've made already uh, because there I have uh, given a total synopsis as well as uh, a line by line reading of the story uh, and you can form your own conclusions and tell me in the comment section if you think the narrator of the yellow wallpaper is unreliable or not. All right. So this was first person limited perspective. Now second person limited perspective. Second person is very weird way of telling a story. And it's a very rare way of telling a story. It's a way in which the you pronoun is used. It's like the narrator directly talks to us and makes us the readers a part of the story. My favorite second person narrator is 
in Italo Calvino's If on a Winter Night, a Traveler, that one. If you ever have a chance, read that book. And it's a very strange book. Why strange? Because if you take up the names of each like individual chapters of that novella and you just write them side by side, you get a complete sentence or a, a stanza with a complete meaning. Wow, like when I first read that, I was in my college, I was so amazed that uh, what kind of a book is this? And then uh, when I started reading the book, it was like nothing I have ever read before. It was like the author was communicating to me, the whole thing was written in present tense. I had never come across a novel or a short story or a fiction thing that was written in present tense. Usually they are always written in the past tense. So it's as if Calvino was asking me to work on the whole thing, to, to walk through the paths with him, to be a part of that story. And that was so unusual. And this is the flavor of second person narration. You get to live the story. You become a character and sometimes you become the protagonist of the story. You become the main character of the story. Now you must be thinking, how can that be possible? I have never experienced that before. But trust me, you have experienced that before if you have ever played video games. I played what Max Payne, IGI, I was, I'm like old school. So I don't know what games are there now in these times, but in every game, in those zombie games, you become the person who is acting and there is this storyline narrated to you asking you to exercise choices. Nowadays, there are these interactive films where uh, after a certain uh, scenes, uh, there is this option given to you. Do you want the character to do this or that? And depending on what choice you make, the movie goes on. So that is second person narration where the readers are pulled inside the story through direct addressing. Sometimes this was also used in case of epistolary technique. Epistolary in the sense when Stories are told in the form of letters written by one character to another. There also only letters are given one after the other. You know, one letter is uh, given to us and then the reply to that letter is given to us. All right. So very similar things are going on nowadays in the social media. I see these posts where these video posts where sequence of whatsapp messages are given and uh, that creates a story and sometimes a very comic stories this is where the you pronoun is also used okay although this is not talking to the reader this is one character talking to the other character through letters and this is also making use of the second person uh, narration uh, as we can see so how do you frame a story if you are using a second person narrative point of view? First is you need to be very detailed about the background, the description. So that when you pull the readers in the story, they can see what's going on around. They can visualize the whole thing and then they can really feel involved in this. It has to be in the present tense. Okay. Third thing is it can be either homodiegetic or heterodiegetic. Now, what's that? Homodiegetic means the narrator is inside the story as a character. Heterodiegetic means the narrator is outside the story. So, even in second person narration, we can have an omniscient narrator, okay, looking down at the whole thing, informing us about different things, informing us about what we might be feeling. Okay, so, and sometimes you can have a blend. Uh, there's a story by O. Henry, The Green Door, where almost one and a half pages go on where uh, O. Henry is talking to us directly or rather I would say the narrator is talking to us directly uh, through second person. Now, what happens if you go there, if you see this, then you are going inside this. So he is placing us in a situation, describing it vividly and he is going on about experimenting with this second person narrative structure 
and then he suddenly starts with the third person where he shifts the whole thing to a single character who is not us and there he shifts to the past tense. So that is amazing how he is shifting not just the narrative is also shifting the tense of narration and he is also shifting the way we feel involved in the story because now it's not our story it's the story of that character he has created for us. So we can also have mixed narratives okay. So this is second person uh, which is again very rare. The most common narrative we find around us is the third person limited where we do not have gods. Nowadays like in modern fiction this concept of a god like narrator is getting more and more obsolete because it's an age where we are prioritizing uh, multiple perspectives. This whole world is about um, personalization. You know, you look at a YouTube video, you get a certain kind of ads. Your friend looks at the same video but gets a different kind or different set of advertisements. Uh, when you open your Amazon, you get one kind of recommendations. When your friend opens his Prime account, he gets a different kind of recommendations. So what's happening here? It's like this whole world has been destabilized into personalized experiences. And somehow this idea of an omniscient, all-seeing, all-powerful narrator is getting more and more obsolete because uh, it's not real enough. So what is real enough? If you are telling a story that you are in the third person talking about a man there or a woman there and you are seeing partial things about that person. So you are a narrator but you do not have all kinds of knowledge. You are limited. That makes you more human. Some information is given to us by this limited persona or narrator and some information are rationed depending on that again the effect of suspense is created. Most of the times this narrator who uses this third person narrative technique uh, they are not of course a part of the story they are not a character in the story if they are in the third person but they will let you look at some of the characters very closely and this perspective can change you know for some moments um, that narrator will talk about one or two characters and then uh, that might shift a little but he will never give you the whole picture because it is limited. Now where have you seen this kind of narration? If you have read Harry Potter you would know what I mean. See in Harry Potter the narrator is not Harry. Harry is not saying that it is my story. Well, I am a boy. He's not doing that. So there is definitely a narrator. Who is the narrator? J.K. Rowling? No, J.K. Rowling is a woman who lives in this world. This narrator lives in this world where magic happens. There are muggles. There is Hogwarts. So this narrator is of course not J.K. Rowling but a persona created by the J.K. Rowling uh, author. What this narrator does in Harry Potter is most of the time, like 95% of the scenes you can say, we are with Harry. We are as if sitting right next to him, looking at him, doing, like observing him. And he is doing things. He is opening doors uh, with spells. He is dozing out fire. He is entertaining himself with friends. He's playing Quidditch. And he is having... A, a kind of interaction with us without directly talking to us because it's not Harry talking to us it's the narrator talking about Harry to us but there are moments when this narrator decides to go a little bit away from Harry maybe to this dark room where Voldemort he is torturing somebody or to this island where Dumbledore is looking at something where Harry is not present yet there are these small little moments given to us which is also in a very limited way because those moments create the mystery, create the suspense. But it's more or less about one character, how he acts and sometimes what he thinks. Because when it is third person limited, 
then the character in focus is completely displayed to us. But even there, you see, it takes a lot of time for us to realize that Harry was only trying to kill the part which was already inside him. So here we see a kind of revelation at the end. And revelation is possible only when you have limited knowledge throughout. So that's why limited perspective creates a more dramatic effect. Because if you are told a story by an omniscient narrator in third person, he would have already told you that, see, Harry is suffering, but he is suffering because of these, 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 these things. The story is created because it is spoken to us by a person who has limited knowledge. The narrator is giving us limited information. All right. So it also helps us switch between different characters at times. Sometimes this narrator in Harry Potter talks about uh, what's going on in Hermione's mind, her, her life, uh, maybe Ron's life, maybe Voldemort's life, Voldemort's childhood. And this is also called head hopping. You know, you hop from head to head. Uh, it creates confusions at times, especially when all those characters are very closely knit together. You don't know when the narrator is speaking through whose head, uh, but it is experimented with by again modern writers and postmodern writers. So third person limited, are they reliable? Like in first person narration, uh, you are not always sure that it's a, it's a reliable narrator. You have to always assume that can I trust this narrator? But in third person narrator, do you trust that narrator? Is that narrator reliable? Are any narrators reliable? What is reliable? When Z. Booth had said that authors and readers, they share a common platform of values, of ideas, or you can say, of what is acceptable and what is not. But again, as I was saying, in this world of personalization, do common platforms exist anymore? Sham Selvadurai, he is the author of Funny Boy. The narrator of Funny Boy is a homosexual and he talks about the story of his life, set in Sri Lanka, fraught with confusion, confusion about gender identity, political identity, social identity. And we begin to sympathize because it's first person narrative, it's autobiographical. But there are moments in this narration where we see that this boy who is speaking to us is destructively patriarchal, actually patriarchal. And he has these assumptions in his mind about how women should behave. And he speaks to us uh, talking about those things. And then we realize that these assumptions are put inside the head of this child by society. And of course, Sham Selvudurai is definitely not that boy in those moments. So how much can we trust this boy? How much can we trust the narration of this boy? Because, uh, you know, during some moments, the figure of the father emerges as the monster. And then during some moments, this is the father who provides a kind of assurance to him. He runs to the father for answers to questions which he has in his mind about race, about racism. Is the father then the monster or is he not? We see the mother cheating on his father. So who is who here? What to trust? So unreliability springs from this destabilization of feeling that we have a common platform. Sham Selvudurai and me, do we have a common platform? Do we look at the world in the same way? Earlier authors and readers, they belong to same communities. British people writing for British readers. Now everybody is writing for everybody. So the question of common ideologies, question of common uh, sentiments, uh, of, of common ground based on religion, caste, creed, everything is destabilized. And therefore, the question of reliability is also getting more and more confusing. And therefore, I feel that we cannot find uh, 
any reliable narrators because we cannot somehow belong to the same platform as the authors, at least not always. Again, think about the legendary Arabian Nights, the, the master of narratives, you can say, where one story fuses into another, into another. And who is the ultimate narrator? The narrator is this woman, Shehrzadi, who wants to tell a story to her husband to pass the night and she wants to keep the story hanging as a cliffhanger so that the husband doesn't kill her and lets her live another day so that he can hear what happens next. Can you trust this narrator? This severely motivated narrator who wants to deliberately give you this cliffhanger to survive. Nonetheless, that is a beautiful legendary, as I was telling you, set of stories. So unreliability, reliability, these don't matter anymore in the present context or present times and it didn't matter back then as well. But yes, when C. Booth's definition is very um, uh, eye-opening because he is the one to actually tell us that the narrator is also a very important character uh, who must be analyzed to understand what the message of the story is. So, we have studied today omniscient narration, limited narration, first person narration, second person narration and third person narration and well the difference between reliable narration and unreliable narration. So out of these if you were to write a novel or a story which narrative mode would you prefer? Tell me in the comment section and if you have already uh, tried writing stories do also tell me about that and see you all in my next video which is also going to be on uh, maybe a different literary term so give me suggestion in that comment box which literary term I should take up next so that you can get the best out of our channel I know you have all subscribed and if you have then also press that notification icon to get notified every time a new video comes up this is Manami Mukaji signing off. Till our next video, stay happy, stay subscribed.